be at. Now we're going to start a recording here tonight. So Revelation 14 is a good spot to, to camp out. And uh, tonight we're continuing the study we've been in for a while now. And if I've counted right, uh, this is our ninth uh, session of this. Uh, speak of the devil. And we've looked at um, Satan and demons uh, from a biblical standpoint. And now we're coming in and actually addressing hell itself. And um, the final few questions that I had from several months ago when I put out uh, that, that survey to see what questions people had about um, Satan and demons and hell, uh, the last few all dealt with hell. Um, so we're going to spend a couple of weeks uh, just looking at what scripture says about hell uh, itself. It's certainly another one of those areas where we have been um, greatly influenced by culture. Uh, we've been greatly influenced by literature and, and art and music. Uh, movies, all those things, um, and maybe part of the reason why is because people, people have, a, I think, a natural curiosity about the afterlife. You know, what happens after we die? Uh, I do think that that is a, I think it's a good curiosity. I think it's a God-given curiosity that if we follow it in the way God intends for it, it leads us to our need for God. Uh, but unfortunately, we are sinful, broken people. So instead of it always leading us to God, a lot of times it leads us in other directions. And there's been a lot of controversy, uh, a lot of uh, debate o over um, not just heaven in particular, but, but, but hell. Uh, the state of, of the wicked. Is there a hell? Is there not a hell? Is it a literal place or just a state of being? Uh, is it a permanent thing or is it an eternal <laughs> thing? Uh, is it an actual location somewhere like that's created? Like, is it in the center of the earth? You know, there, there's all of those kind of questions that are around out there. Uh, does Satan really rule over it? Uh, did Jesus go to hell? Uh, I remember that was one of the questions that was presented uh, to us, which we'll address here in a couple of weeks. And, um, and you know, the struggle, I think, for the idea of hell for a lot of people it comes from this tension between the two characteristics of God. The characteristic of the love of God is one of those characteristics that even unbelievers, the unchurched, anyone who will say there is a God or there might be a God even, would say that God has to be love, right? Love has to be one of the, the, the biggest part of God, is what a lot of people will say. But because of that, a lot of people don't see God's justice as one of his characteristics too. He is just, just like he is love. Um, they are both parts of who he is. They're both 100% to the fullest. Uh, therefore, it's not that one outweighs the other. They have to work hand in hand perfectly. And so that idea of, of, of a loving God and people going to hell seems to be this idea that people really struggle with uh, a lot. And so it causes all these things. Uh, Bertrand Russell uh, was a British philosopher um, in the mid-1900s. And, uh, and here's, what, here's what he says. He says, there is one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character. And that is that he believed in hell. And go on and say uh, that, that hell was a doctrine that put cruelty in the world and gave the world's generations of cruel torture. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people kind of feel that way when they really sit down and try to, try to reconcile things without really understanding who God is. Um, for an unbelieving world, Scripture says that the Word of God is foolishness, right? It doesn't make sense without the Holy Spirit being in us and illuminating us and, and, and guiding us and directing us in that. And so trying to trying to put all this stuff <clears> together <throat> and saying, here's this place of eternal torment that's supposed to be so horrible, but here's a guy that's supposed to love people so much. You know, how do you put those together? I think it's created that idea in a lot of folks of just how do we do this thing? How does this work? And it's put kind of this blemish, if you will, uh, in their minds on either who God is or on the doctrine of hell itself. So... Um, the doctrine of hell is most definitely, and I'll say it here, and we'll come back and look at this here in a few weeks, but uh, hell is definitely a place, according to Scripture, that is reserved for people who do not put their faith in Christ. Uh, I will probably, uh, for the remainder, at least today, if not next week and all, uh, I'll probably simplify that because people who do not put their faith in Christ, that's a lot of words. Uh, <laughs> I probably will go to the wicked. Uh, because uh, one of the reasons why is because when you look for things like 
uh, theology books, systematic theologies, and those kinds of things. A lot of times we refer to it's, it's referred to more as the wicked, uh, and that's because that's a big, broad, general uh, concept. When I say the wicked, I'm just talking about just sinners, not folks who don't put their faith in Christ, right? People who die without faith in Christ. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to take a look at and see kind of what Scripture says. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that in, in all Scripture. The person who spoke about hell the most was Jesus. Mm. When you read through the Gospels, Jesus is constantly speaking about hell. When you go to the book of Revelation, book of Revelation, a revelation of Jesus Christ, right? He's giving these words, right? He's giving the description, all these, he talks about hell an awful lot, right? Mm. Uh, you know, he's constantly doing that. And part of that is because he wanted us to know that it's a real place. Uh, he wants us to have a warning. He wants us to have some idea of what it is. So that's where we're going to start tonight. And I'm going to start with uh, some of the terms before we really get into looking at the direct scripture. Uh, I want you to get some of the terms from Old Testament and New Testament that, that are often related to the idea of hell. Um, some of y'all know this uh, because I've said it in other things before, and I'm not going to really have time in the next few weeks to get into this unless someone's just super, super interested in it. Uh, then maybe at the very end of this over with, we can get into it. But uh, I will show a card to you. Um, uh, I am a a two compartment theory guy uh, which essentially I has and in short uh, we don't have a finished heaven and a finished hell yet uh, so sometimes the scripture is referring to things that's referring to the eternal place uh, the finalized hell or the finalized heaven and sometimes it's talking about the one that's currently there now uh, we get in the book of revelation talks about new heaven and new earth all these things we, we kind of see some of that uh, so uh, I'll show that card so that you don't advance that's where I am I'm not going to talk too much about that but one of the things, one of the reasons why I go there is because of some of these terms. Um, because there are some very different terms in Scripture used for some of these things. So, Old Testament, the number one word in Old Testament uh, that you will see that often refers to, uh, or is translated sometimes as hell, uh, is the word Sheol. Uh, now, uh, Sheol is one of those really debated, interesting words. Uh, part of it because none of us are, are uh, speak... Uh, uh, by nature, uh, ancient Hebrew, uh, <laughs> we just don't have it. Uh, but uh, in, in, in Scripture, uh, every uh, translation uh, translates Sheol in several different ways. Uh, whether it's King James or NASB or ESV or whatever, they all do this uh, because uh, there's a lot of debate. But uh, sometimes you see it as the grave. Sometimes you see it as a pit. Uh, sometimes it's just Sheol. The word itself is put there. Sometimes it's translated as hell. Uh, um, and when you begin to look at the instances of Sheol throughout the Old Testament, uh, almost all the time it seems to really be focused more on a place of where the physical body is itself. Um, so the idea of the grave or uh, sometimes the idea of just the place of the dead not assigning heaven or hell or, or reward or punishment or that just when you're dead one thing about shield is it, it talks about this in scripture everybody goes to shield when you read through some of the passages everybody doesn't go to heaven everybody doesn't go to hell everybody doesn't get reward everybody doesn't get punishment but every dead body goes in the grave right that's the idea especially coming from uh, a a uh, hebrew mindset back in this day so a lot of times when you read through the passages talk about shield it describes kind of a, a basic idea of where a tomb would have been like, right? Dark. Uh, there had been in the ground. Uh, it had been buried in there. Uh, there had been this idea of being uh, uh, inescapable. Uh, those kinds of things that show up a lot uh, with that. Um, Hades is kind of the word that most closely aligns, aligns to that in the New Testament. Um, as a matter of fact, when they translated the Old Testament into Greek, uh, the Septuagint, they used the word Hades there for the word Sheol. Uh, and so they kind of carry some similar ideas, but by the time we get to Greek, um, the word Hades was, was, was a proper noun, right? If you remember your Greek mythology from elementary school, uh, Hades was the, the god of the, of the netherworld, right? He was the god that oversaw the underworld uh, type of a deal. Um, wasn't just this idea of punishment, but it was like the, the, the pathway into, into the afterlife it had to go through Hades. Uh, and so by the time we get to the New Testament, Hades had uh, really kind of taken on a, a, a commonplace name. Um, it was really kind of the, the state of death. Um, in some cases, in some places, 
It is obvious it refers to a place of punishment uh, in the New Testament. And so you kind of got that idea that floats around a little bit. Um, um, Guyana is, is, is the one that uh, probably we refer to the most um, in the New Testament. Uh, Twelve different times uh, is where we, we see that word pop up in the New Testament. And uh, every time it's referring to eternal punishment. Uh, it comes from, from the word uh, Gehenna. Uh, so we're talking about the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, south of Jerusalem uh, in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, and actually, uh, Jeremiah prophesies that, this is gonna be a, that that valley is going to be a place of God's judgment. Uh, Jeremiah 7, verse 32, he says that. Uh, Jeremiah 19, 6. And uh, by the time we get to the New Testament, that area was being used as a, as a dump, dumping ground for criminals' bodies. Uh, for dead bodies that were claimed or were considered to be um, folks that were outcasts, those kind of things, uh, folks that didn't deserve a proper burial. Uh, it was a place of refuse. It's where you dumped all of your garbage and your refuse at. There were burning bodies of refuse there. Uh, the smoke was constantly in the air. There was a stench constantly in the air. Um, it's one of the pictures that we have with, with Calvary also, kind of with that in the picture, in the background kind of an area. Uh, some people have said that, that the hill that Jesus was crucified was right over the top of that. Um, topograph, topographically, I don't know that that works, um, but that's one of those areas I haven't dug into enough um, to, to be able to confirm or not confirm um, if, if by the layer of the land that would work. But, um, but it's really common. Uh, most time when you see the word hell in the New Testament, that is the word that's usually uh, being used for that. Uh, it always has this idea of uh, eternal punishment, uh, final judgment. Uh, when you think about it, it makes sense. All these dead bodies being piled up, that part of their judgment of being criminals or crooks or whatever they did, uh, enemies, they're all there, just buried and being burned, uh, which would have been a, uh, culturally would have been an insult to not be buried in the ground and to be burned like that. That would have been a big deal. So uh, that's part of their judgment. Uh, there's one word that's really interesting that's, that shows up that's often translated as hell. In 2 Peter chapter 2, it's the word uh, Tartaru, uh, which is really interesting. It's the only place it's found in all, all scriptures right there in, in 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, Tartarus uh, was, a mytho was, a, was in mythology uh, the place where uh, fallen gods and um, those who were considered to be like mighty warriors that went against the gods, like the Titans, uh, it's where they would have gone to be punished. Um, the Greeks actually believed that this was a literal place in the earth, uh, that would have been below Hades. Um, so it was a place of greater punishment for those that were considered to be stronger and rebelled in a greater way against the gods. Uh, but it's used in, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, 4. And um, the Hellenists, the Hellenistic Jews, uh, so the, the Jews that spoke Greek, had adopted this word uh, really as, the, as part of the idea of hell. It was really a place of punishment uh, and a place of extreme punishment. Uh, for a lot of the Jews, there would have been the idea of levels of punishment, which we're going to talk about in a week or two, uh, whether there are levels of punishment, uh, different levels of hell. Um, and so they would have included this in part of that idea. Um, abyss is another word you see pop up a lot uh, from uh, Busos. Uh, it's bottomless, it's the prison of the demons. Uh, Luke 8 shows that, Luke 8, 31. Uh, Revelation 9 has that. Uh, and Revelation 9 actually tells us that, that Satan is the king of the demons there. He rules over the demons in the abyss. Uh, it's also the same word you see in Revelation 20, uh, at the end of the millennium, uh, or before the beginning of the millennium, excuse me, when Satan is bound, he's thrown into the abyss, bound for a thousand years before he's released. Um, so you kind of see all these words pop up. Uh, but all of them would refer to what, in, in our minds, other than Sheol, in our minds, really all these words kind of contribute to the idea of, of hell. Um, I believe hell is something we use in a very umbrella-like term um, because there are so many different aspects to this thing. So, let's get into some of those aspects. The first question, probably the, the best one we have to answer, is, have, is hell a real place, right? Is hell a real place? I always find that interesting because the question usually goes, is hell a real place if it is, did God create it? Uh, those could kind of go hand in hand, but very rarely do people want to ever postulate that heaven is the real place. Everybody wants heaven to be real, but people don't want hell to be real, right? So hell has to be made up or, or just figurative language or whatever. Even if you have a different idea of, of what heaven is, 
And, you know, the majority of people want there to be a heaven, but don't want it to be hell. Which makes sense if, if hell is what Scripture says it is, if hell is what Orthodox Christianity has, has taught uh, for a couple of thousand years now. I don't want there to be a hell either. But, according to Scripture, there is a hell. So Matthew 25 uh, 41. I told you guys I'll try to take some of the scriptures slow. These first couple of scriptures, I'm really going to just kind of stop and let's see what, what hell is according to scripture. <clears throat> so Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus is talking. He says that hell was a, a place of being departed from God. So separated from God. We talk about that, right? Uh, we talk about spiritual death. We talk about being separated from the presence of God, uh, which means something a little different than we mean a lot of times. Um, let me, let me clarify separated from the presence of God. We're talking about being separated from the presence of God. We're talking about being separated from his glory, right? Uh, it's not that God isn't in hell. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. Therefore, you're not separated from him completely. You're separated from the glory, from, from the joy, um, from the benefit of who God is. Um, it also says that it's a place for the cursed in Matthew 25, 41. Um, so that's the opposite of being blessed, right? Uh, so that makes sense. You go to hell. It's because you're cursed, right? That's, that's not a blessing to go to hell. Uh, it's always funny to, to listen to people um, that want to want to kind of make hell out to be this place to go party. Like, me and my friends, I'm okay. Oh, See you in hell, buddy. That's where we're <laughs> no, it's a place of uh, being cursed. You're not going to be blessed. It's not going to be a fun time kind of a deal. <laughs> you know, that, that's pretty clear in Matthew 25, uh, 41. Uh, it also gives us this idea of eternal fire. Um, that there is this idea of punishment. Uh, a lot of times we talk about eternal fire, I think we go straight to the heat, or at least I do, because to me, I'm already hot in here. Um, you know, much less uh, in their fire. Uh, as a firefighter, I've caught myself in the middle of fires before. It's hot. Uh, but beyond that, the fire is really more the idea, uh, carries more the idea of the punishment that goes mm -hmm. along with it. Um, and if nothing else, we want to look at it this way, the purifying, fire purifies, right? Um, so our sins are eternal. One sin, eternal, eternal punishment, right? Because we have sinned against the eternal, infinite God. So even though our finite, we have sin that's finite, the sin technically isn't finite, it's infinite because you sin against the infinite God. So it, it deserves an infinite, infinite punishment, an infinite cleansing act, right? So infinite burning. Um, also, in Matthew 25, 40, uh, in, in Matthew 25, 41, it says, The hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. We just answered two questions right there. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Uh, so, yes, God didn't make hell. I just said it, right? God prepared it, right? God made hell. Uh, it's a place that wasn't like Satan didn't leave heaven and go, like, I'm going to go make my own place. I'm going to make me a, you know, a fallen angel cave, uh, you know, or whatever. He actually, it's a place that God designed for Satan and, and, and his angels is what it says, uh, what we would call demons. Uh, a couple of verses later in Matthew 25 and verse 46, it says, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, two key words to hell. And, if, and really, if I, if, I had, if I only had two words to describe hell, these are the two words I would use, right? Eternal punishment. Mm -hmm. Forever punished, right? On, 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 on. I mean, that's, that's uh, probably the, the shortest summation of hell, I think, that I could possibly be an eternal right. punishment. Uh, you know, the, to really get our idea. Maybe back uh, in a day when we use this word more, someone might be able to say damnation. But uh, we're, we're in a culture now where that con the, uh, that word isn't even used enough for us to even have a, a real idea of what that is. Uh, so uh, that's one spot where we see uh, hell popping up and this idea of whether it's real or not. Um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. Uh, I told you we get to Matthew to Revelation 14. Uh, it's coming up, I promise you. Uh, Matthew 8, 12 says, talks about people being thrown outside into the darkness, uh, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, and this shows up again in Matthew 25. Also, I just wanted to show you a different spot. Uh, earlier in Matthew 25, 30, this shows up. But, I mean, listen to that. You're outside. Outside of what? In hell, that means you're, you're outside of the, the presence, the glory of God, right? Uh, you're not in heaven. You're outside of where God is um, and manifesting his glory. Uh, so you're outside of that. Uh, you're in the darkness. Um, so, um, and I'll talk about darkness a little bit on Sunday. Um, one thing that happens with darkness, and we'll get this a little bit more when we get to the, the maybe more of the characteristics of, of hell, but uh, darkness is a lonely place. Uh, that's where I always kind of just shake my head off that whole party it up in, in hell idea. 
You're not going to be hanging out with people. Um, you're going to be in darkness. That's a very lonely, dark, depressing place. And spiritually, there's a darkness there. Uh, and it says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, there have been, I've had a lot of pain in life. I've been injured on many occasions. Um, I've gone through a lot of grief over things, um, personal and in ministry. And I can count on one hand the number of times that I have weeped and gnashed teeth. Um, I mean, we were even in a five-car pileup and flipped over three times and landed upside down, and I didn't weep or gnash my teeth. Um, that's that's some severe punishment. Um, and I, that's not only physical punishment there. I think that's a, a mental and spiritual punishment that causes that type of a thing. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this next week, I believe, is why I've got the schedule for it. But um, the idea of realizing that you rejected God and you rejected his glory and who he is and then you have to leave all of that um, I think that's enough anguish to cause this on top of the physical punishment uh, so now, Revelation 14 I said we'd get there uh, verse 10 is what I want us to read uh, you know what let's just go back to verse 9 so we get context verse 9 says then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Um, one of the reasons why, why I wanted us to look at that, that passage together is because that's a pretty powerful passage. And I know that's referring to a time uh, when, at least I believe the church will be raptured before this point. But um, for those who are on the earth when this happens, uh, that's a. And the, those that follow the beast and take his mark. That, that doesn't sound like a fun time to me, right? Uh, you know, it says that they're going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Um, so when Corey and I first got married, um, I was in ministry. I didn't get married in ministry until we'd been married for four years or so is when I, I surrendered to ministry. Um, we went on our honeymoon. And Rusty, trying to be the nice romantic guy that he is, and uh, having some different thoughts on things than he has currently, went and bought a bottle of wine. First of all, I would never buy a bottle of wine now. But second of all, I learned that if you're going to buy a bottle of wine, you better know what you're doing. Um, and I got some wine that I thought looked fruity because she would like that. I don't like pretty much anything fruity. Uh, I, don't, I don't even like, you know, Super fruity Kool Aid. I don't even like. Uh, I like Kool Aid. Just don't like the real fruity stuff. Uh, but this was Hardy Burgundy. Hardy Burgundy looked like this tasted like I was drinking something out of someone's shoe. Uh, we both took about two sips, and that bottle got tossed. Um, it was hard to swallow, and it was disgusting. Um, and it did turn our stomachs a little bit, if I remember right. And I, I just can't think of it. If a little bit of sip of, of a wine that was supposed to taste good was that bad a cup of, of, of wrath from God the end of itself is going to be horrible beyond bitter right <laughs> horrible in of itself um, I don't even want to know if I'm going to start to really imagine how bad that's going to be um, you know that, that's the idea of God pouring out his wrath on you uh, we see glimpses of God's wrath for unbelievers. We see glimpses of God's chastisement. Mm -hmm. His chastisement's enough for me. Uh, he takes me to the woodshed enough that I'll, you know, I'll come back with my tail tucked between my legs a lot, uh, much less actually opening up his wrath and pouring it out on us. And then when you start reading from that point forward, especially in Revelation, you really see what part of that looks like, right? Um, he says it's mixed in its full strength, right? The cup of his anger. Um, just think about a tornado or a hurricane. Uh, I don't know we go horrible tornadoes because that's something we're a little more familiar with. Uh, Tennessee, we're certainly familiar mm -hmm. with it. I was thinking the other day about how 
you know, today the tornado, you know, is going to come the next day the school's canceled. When I was a kid, you had to stick your head between your knees and sit in the hallway. And I was like, sticking my head between the knees was, was going to kill me. It wasn't going to be the tornado, right? I couldn't do that part. But, uh, you know, just think about the power. You know, 150 mile an hour winds come through. I, I've done disaster relief stuff with the SBC, the actual tornadoes a couple of times, and seen uh, pine needles stuck through a tree before, those kinds of things. And just the power that's in that, and that's just, that's an exhale from God. You know, much less pouring out his entire wrath on us, full strength. I mean, just imagine how bad it is. It says, it says that they're going to be tormented <coughs> with fire and the brimstone. So there's that, that punishment, that torture again. And notice what it says after that. In verse 10, uh, fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. I know the first time I mentioned, I don't know, several months ago, before we ever got to this series or whatever, when I mentioned the fact that, that hell doesn't mean the, the, pres the absence of the presence of God doesn't mean that God's not going to be in hell. Um, I had eyebrows raised. <laughs> in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Uh, <laughs> um, now, it's, it's there, right? That, 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 that punishment is happening there. Uh, does that mean they're hanging out in hell and people are getting the glory? No. Um, but the presence of God is everywhere. That's part of that omnipresence, right? And the smoke of the torment goes on forever, and they have no rest day or night, right? There's no break from it, uh, no break at all. Uh, when we were in Haiti, the, 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 the last time I went to Haiti, it was 130 degrees. Um, literally, when I got out of bed, you could smell bacon. It was me frying already first thing in the morning, right? I mean, it's hot. Uh, and the problem with it was the, the year before we went, uh, Hurricane... Sandy, the one that came up to America and went up to the northeast and dropped a bunch of snow and all that. It's Hurricane Sandy hit us while we were down there. Wonderful weather. It was cloudy. It was windy. Yes, we were on, you know, homemade wooden ladders that we had just nailed together to, to work on this thing, which, you know, scares the guy that don't like aluminum ladders. But, uh, but it was great. And then it turned on the next year, and the difference was not only we didn't have a storm, but there was no shade anywhere. What we were working at was in this middle of this cane field. There's no relief from the heat whatsoever. No shade or nothing whatsoever. You just feel like you're just gonna cook and die and melt when you're not used to that kind of stuff, right? And I can't think, help but think about that. I mean, we were out of that stuff 12, 14 hours. You know, that was it. We go inside, eat, shower, you know, get in, get in the shade kind of deal. 24 seven, seven days a week, 365. Of course, by this time we don't have time really going. For all of eternity, you're suffering. Uh, you know, that just, there's no end to it, you know, day or night. Uh, one thing, and, and we'll get into this eventually, I just wanted to mark this out for you. It talks about the smoke coming up. Uh, there's one place in Scripture, in Revelation, uh, where that smoke is actually a, used as a, as a symbol of praise uh, for God, where the martyrs and those that are in heaven praise God for the destruction of Babylon, how her smoke rises to the heaven um, as testimony of God's justice. Oh, and that's, it's a really interesting mix to think about the justice and, and, the, and the, the love of God there. So uh, a couple more places I wanted to hit real quick uh, for us to see uh, before, I, before I stop there. Uh, just to talk about um, the, the reality of, of, of hell. Uh, in Mark 9, Jesus says, in Mark 9, 30, 43, um, he says that, that hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So now on top of the fire, we're adding in the worm, right? Uh, so that's that idea of uh, worms typically uh, signify this idea of death and decay, uh, rot, right? So uh, sulfur, a lot of times we associate with it too, which sulfur stinks. Uh, you know, there's a, this, so that's the kind of this rotten, torturous, you know, every, every sense that you have is really covered in these descriptions. Uh, especially the ones that Jesus gives us. Before, before we get done, all five senses are touched uh, with the idea of torment, right? Um, in Revelation 9, uh, 1 and 2, and then verse 11, he calls it a bottomless pit, an abyss. Um, I'll, I'll give you one more and we'll stop. Um, in Revelation 20, verse 10, after Satan's rebellion is crushed, it says, The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, so, and we're going to come back to this next week. 
because uh, we'll talk about the idea of is hell forever? Is it for all eternity or not? And I want to tell you, inside Christian circles, the idea of whether or not hell is for eternity is quickly changing. Um, there's always been a small group of people that have pushed that it was a temporary thing where they didn't exist at all, but inside evangelical Christianity, mainstream Christianity, we're starting to see more and more people move away from the idea of an eternal hell. Uh, but just right here, right? Tormented day and night, <coughs> forever <coughs> and ever. Uh, that, there's no end to that, right? Uh, and so we see all these things as you start to put them together, it starts to give you kind of a picture uh, of, of the fact that this is a real place where there's real literal punishment that, that literal uh, Satan and, and the fallen angels go to and those who are wicked, those who, who die without their faith in Christ, this is a place where they go and they spend eternity. Uh, so next week we'll pick up right there and, uh, and we'll look a little further at this idea of, of what is hell actually like. Uh, is it eternal? And we'll look at some of the theories behind that too. So I'll pull some of that in. Uh, we'll look at uh, annihilationism and some of those things. Um, so, um, and then we'll get a little deeper into who goes to hell. Because um, as important as it is to know that there is a hell, I think it's more important to really understand the who goes to hell um, idea more than anything else. So uh, I'm going to stop there because we're out of time. But uh, any questions, comments, anything that, that we need to hear real quick before we close out for the evening?